can you provide a definition for the word woman? So I'm not a biologist. Of movement of migrants. Out surge of, of migrants. Record number of migrants. Words can shape history and minds. And these days, words seem to be the weapon in our culture wars. What do you think is the impact on a society when its official record of language and what words mean can change in real time as fast as it's changing today? The impacts, I think, actually end up being rather dire. This week, we'd like to have a word with you. In the United States, there is serious debate about funding wars on multiple fronts. But Iran seems to be funding three separate terrorist groups with ease. What happened to the U.S. sanctions on Iran? We had some nice sanctions that actually worked with the Trump administration. So what sanctions are in place? And I'm not sure we have a whole lot of them left anymore. In the parched plains of Arizona, there is one hot topic. We examine what has become an international battle for water. Welcome to Full Measure. I'm Cheryl Ackeson. 20th century radical activist Saul Alinsky once wrote, he who controls the language controls the masses. Never has that thought been more relevant. Right now, activists are busily working to redefine select words in real time, manipulating meanings to accomplish social and propaganda goals. How they do it and why is the topic of today's cover story, What's in a Name? Perhaps nothing is more emblematic of efforts to mold our language and the confusion and debate that can spark than the 2022 hearing to nominate Kentonji Brown Jackson to the Supreme Court. Can you provide a definition for the word woman? Can I provide a definition? Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. I can't. You can't? Mm, not in okay. this context. So I'm not a biologist. Left-leaning USA Today insisted Jackson's puzzling non-answer was scientifically sound and declared to the surprise of many, there is no sufficient way to clearly define what makes someone a woman. The exchange came as transgender activists worked to blur the once solid line between male and female. Fierce criticism was building over men participating in women's sports. William Thomas switched from the men's to the women's swim team at the University of Pennsylvania, shattering numerous records as Leah. <laughs> the spike in online searches for the term woman prompted Dictionary.com to declare woman word of the year, defining it as an adult female person. Are special interests and advocacy groups able to influence how we define terms today? Absolutely. So if anyone knows about manipulating language, it's Kelly Wright. You could define her as an experimental sociolinguist and lexicographer, or a word mapper. I look at how words change over time and, and put them into an official space. What do you think is the impact on a society when its official record of language and what words mean can change in real time as fast as it's changing today? The impacts, I think, actually end up being rather dire because official definitions of language really control the way that our like, law and policy works. So even something as saying, like, anyone who's female-bodied is a woman really affects, it affects how people are incarcerated, how they're treated in healthcare, you know, all, all these things that the, that the state has to control. So very small changes in language have huge effects for how, you know, our, our society is administered. You might think the purpose of dictionaries is to explain the meanings of words, but they're frequently used by activists to distort understood definitions and convince people to think differently. One example is the word migrant. For decades, migrant commonly referred to foreigners temporarily coming to the U.S. 
But now, migrant has become widely used to describe all illegal border crossers. That includes those who intend to permanently live in the U.S. as immigrants or asylum seekers, as well as criminals, drug dealers, and human traffickers facilitating crime. Concerns tonight over Chicago's movement of migrants. The surge of migrants on the border. Thousand board. migrant encounters. The migrant crisis. With a record number of migrants crossing into the U.S. Pushing the move to redefine migrant can be traced to the Trump era and massive efforts to undermine his border security policies. As late as December of 2016, Dictionary.com listed the common definition of migrant. A person who moves from place to place to get work, especially a farm laborer who harvests crops seasonally. But by May of 2017, with President Trump in the White House, there's suddenly a brand new definition of migrant. A person who attempts to permanently relocate to a new country, but who may be subject to removal by the government of that country. Illegal immigrant was used for a long time, and people suddenly start starting to use migrant for the same thing. So do you feel as though there might have been a directed effort to change that term by somebody and then it got picked up by the dictionaries? I do, because I think, I don't know if it was an, an individual. You know, it might be more reflective of, you know, a way of thinking or, or, you know, a handful of folks. What may be more remarkable is how that handful of folks can convince the rest of us to adopt the language of advocacy even when inaccurate. Transphobic is used to disparage people not fully aligned with the transgender agenda, even when they aren't actually phobic about or fearful of trans people. Anti-vaccine is frequently used as a slur against people who aren't, in fact, against vaccines. The term was almost unheard of until 2008, when it was popularized by pharmaceutical industry allies and media amid growing vaccine safety concerns. CDC used to define vaccines as agents that prevent disease. But after it was clear that COVID vaccines don't do that, CDC invented a new definition that makes them seem successful anyway. Now vaccines, CDC says, merely stimulate the body's immune response. And then, you know, we can look at everything having to do with gender. That's, that's pronouns and, and, and how, how people are trying to ap apply equity and how it, it in different institutions comes out in different ways in the wash. For example, gender confirmation is widely used to describe a process that some would say is actually gender denial, changing appearance to live life as the opposite sex. Women's reproductive rights is used in place of abortion rights, even though it typically doesn't refer to the right to bear children or reproduce. I think that that change had a lot to do with the efforts a handful of years ago to close like every Planned Parenthood in the world. Um, and they, Planned Parenthood and their lobbying arm, which is quite strong, made an effort to say, we don't just provide abortions. We provide women's reproductive care. So and sometimes redefining, you know, it's like a rebrand. I saw an article in Medscape, should we rename obesity? and talking about a stigma with obesity and thinking maybe we shouldn't discourage it or make it sound bad. Sure. James and the Diet Peach, new editions of that were put out in this last year because they removed the word fat from this story. It was like, how can we talk about James and the Diet Peach without talking about fatness? <laughs> we can change the word obesity, but until we change the way we feel about fat people, whatever new label we give it is gonna function the same way. I've noticed that instead of saying somebody committed suicide, there's an effort to say or have people say they died by suicide. Yeah, yeah. Which I find hard to figure out because it almost sounds like something happened to them outside of their control. Exactly. Died by suicide is something in, this, in the same realm of like person first language where people accept that like anyone who gets to the point of killing themselves is probably is likely dealing with mental illness that's i think what died by suicide is trying to recognize but i agree with you it's quite difficult to apply it that way because it's not something that happens to you it's something you do so how exactly are a relative few able to influence the vocabulary of the masses one way is through members of the boards that put dictionaries together and write the definitions Wright serves on the board of a dictionary called Among the New Words with the American Dialect Society. 
people with certain expertise do like certain sections of the dictionaries. Is it possible for advocates to get board members placed on these dictionary boards? Absolutely. More influence comes by activists directly contacting dictionaries to persuade them. It strikes me that those who may actually be in the majority of our society who prefer to preserve a term in certain, as, as used in certain cases, don't really stand a chance against those who are trying to change a term. I'll just say from like a professional, you know, um, perspective, we deal with that in our dictionary a lot, actually, because the only people who engage with us are people who are advocating for a certain cause, who say, we want this word in, this is why. The general public maybe isn't motivated to change language or to make it seem official the ways in which language is changing. Or to lobby you to keep it the same. Or to lobby us to keep it the same, which we would listen to. Our final example looks at the evolving definition of female, which, like woman, has been the subject of heavy lobbying. In 2016, Dictionary.com told us a female is a person bearing two X chromosomes in the cell nuclei and normally having a vagina, a uterus, and ovaries and retaining a beardless face. Today, Dictionary.com has decided being female is no longer genetic or biological. It's relating to a gender identity that corresponds to a complex, variable set of social and cultural roles, traits, and behaviors. Wright says if there's one takeaway to the molding of our language, it's that your interpretations are as important as anybody else's, if only you'd weigh in. And there's no law saying we're required to use or accept certain definitions. I think that this idea that, you know, seeing a handful of people or an individual like move language or like legally change language in a way that changes your life, I think shows us how powerful it is and in, in, in a way that we shouldn't, we shouldn't hide or resist our ideas. Um, even if they're at odds with others, it's, it's worth expressing them. So how exactly can you weigh in? The American Dialect Society and most dictionaries have forms you can fill out online to suggest words or comment on definitions. At dictionary.com, you can find it by clicking Contact Us on the website. Ahead on Full Measure, the U.S. connection to all the Islamic extremist terrorism you've been hearing about in the Mideast. It may seem like there are three separate conflicts in the Mideast, all involving Islamic extremist terrorist groups, Hamas, Hezbollah, and the Houthis. But Iran is said to be behind all of them. Some analysts say it proves that a U.S.-Iran deal made under the Obama administration was a bad idea and sanctions intended to keep them in line have failed. Lisa Fletcher reports. We had some nice sanctions that actually worked within the Trump administration with regards to the oil that they could sell. And it was hurting Iran from the standpoint that they made it very difficult for them to sell oil. And as a result, their economy was drying up. Republican Blaine Lutkemeyer heads a House committee that oversees U.S. sanctions or punishment against Iran. The Biden administration comes in, takes those, those sanctions off, and suddenly now in the last three years, they've actually uh, raised about $80 billion from oil sales that are now, as you say, funding the three different terrorist groups. And the, the latest one is, is, is the Houthis, who are really starting to get on the radar screen for everybody as they attack a lot of the oil tankers and different trade ships in the uh, Middle East over there to the, to the Strait. And so I uh, don't really understand why, uh, unless you want to support Iranian activities, which I have a hard time believing our administration wants to do that. But from their actions, that's what it looks like. U.S. sanctions against Iran go back to the 70s and the Carter administration. After Iran seized the U.S. embassy in the country's capital of Tehran and held 52 Americans hostage for 444 days, known as the Iran hostage crisis. Good evening. The U.S. embassy in Tehran has been invaded and occupied by Iranian students. During the Clinton administration, sanctions began to target Iran's ambitions to build a nuclear weapon. The Obama administration took a step away from enforcing sanctions and signed an accord along with five other countries in 2015, which dropped billions of dollars in economic sanctions in exchange for Iran agreeing to restrict its nuclear activities and allow international inspections. 
Under the Obama administration, uh, they eased up on some sanctions if Iran agreed to pull back on its nuclear program. President Trump reversed that and increased sanctions. Now under the Biden administration, what what is the status of the, the nuclear agreement? <laughs> That's a good question. We're all wondering where we're at on that because, you know, we can, we can from the appearances of it, is that they're, you know, we're still where we were with the Trump administration from the standpoint that we're not supporting it and taking off some of the, the sanctions initially by the Biden administration. So I don't know where we're at exactly, but I would be very concerned. This is, this is a really big deal. Uh, the, the Iranians are not a, a group I think that we need to uh, take lightly. Uh, they are very concerning, very concerning. So what sanctions are in place? And I'm not sure we have a whole lot of them left anymore. Um, you know, they have uh, the $10 billion that was there as a result of the uh, electricity sales fr from Iraq. Um, and so there's some money sitting there that we're not real sure how that's going to be spent. There's supposed to be some ties on that, but yet there's not a whole lot of accountability on it, and we're not really sure we can actually uh, follow all those dollars. Uh, then we have the $6 billion that uh, we traded access back to the uh, Iranians as a result of, of them freeing up some hostages. Just recently, they refroze that uh, as a result of some of their activities with regards to financing terrorism. But um, the Treasury Department tells me that they were trying to uh, put in place some accountability measures on those so that they could actually follow those dollars. Technically, they were not supposed to be able to access that for anything other than humanitarian aid. What could that money do for Iran? Six billion dollars. Six billion dollars is a lot of money whenever you start talking about the cost of things in the Middle East. In a discussion the other day, you know, Hamas is getting in the neighborhood of 100 to 200 million dollars a year from Iran. It's a lot you of money. You can fund a lot of Hamases around the world at 100 to 200 million dollars. Now, they're probably going to need more since they're in the middle of this fight right now, but they have been doing it to that, to that level. So if, if that's the case, Six billion dollars would fund a lot of terrorism around the world. Late last year, Lutkemeyer sponsored a bipartisan bill to prevent Iran from using humanitarian aid for terrorism. The House has yet to put it to a vote. How accountable are they really for the money that is supposed to be used for humanitarian aid? It seems like a real stretch <laughs> for the United States to be able to guarantee that that money is actually being used in the way the Iranian government says it's being used. Well, I, I appreciate your cynicism. I think we all have that amount of cynicism. Now, uh, you'll get a lot of arguments to say that they're not watching them closely enough or not, not doing their due diligence. But does Treasury make an independent decision to pull back on sanctions or to not enforce sanctions, or is that at someone else's instruction? I'm going to guess on this one, but I, which is not a very good way to go about it. But uh, the Treasury Department will take action based on the administration's emphasis on what, how they feel about these things. If they just kind of wink and nod and say, well, you know, um, you know, we really don't want you to do this, but we're not going to really have any consequences to it. If you do, um, off you go. And that's kind of the way we're handing a lot of sanctions right now with China. We just don't enforce them to the, to the point we need to. He mentioned Iran funding terror cells here in the U.S. Yes, and he followed that with telling me that there are about 25 to 30 sleeper cells lying in wait in the U.S. right now, probably brewing some similar 9-11 attack. And he said the only antidote to that is strong economic and strong border policies, which he says are the only thing that Iran understands. Lots of reason for concern. Yeah. Thanks, Lisa. And when we return, the foreign thirst for American water. For more than a decade, the state of Arizona has seemed to be in a perpetual state of drought. That's focused attention on the growing battles over the U.S. water supply and on the foreign thirst for American water. Scott Thuman reports. In Salome, Arizona, 90 minutes west of Phoenix, there's little room to escape those hot summer days where the average temperature is 102 in a state with more than 300 days of sun every year. And that means water is a hot commodity, which makes these fields the fodder for some equally scorching criticism. I am mad. <laughs> I'm very frustrated. 
Holly Irwin, supervisor for La Paz County, is sounding the alarm over what she calls the state's unchecked use of groundwater for the alfalfa hay that for years has been grown, harvested and shipped from these western Arizona fields to the Middle East. Who's to say how much they're pumping out? There's no structure for any of this and eventually over time the amount of groundwater pumping there's going to be none. Fondamonte, Arizona, is a Saudi Arabian-based company that has owned 10,000 acres here since the year 2015. The hay they produce has been sent back overseas to feed cattle. Some of these pumps specifically to this location varies anywhere from 3,500 um, gallons per minute up to 4,300 gallons per minute. It's a lot of water. That's one well. That's just one. They have quite a few on this property. The farm's rural location means the state did not require the company to seek permission to farm, drill wells, or report on or pay for any water use. So much alfalfa is grown and harvested here, trucks hauling it create a perennial traffic jam. Are you seeing all of it? I mean, it's all day, all day this happens. You'll see hay go in and out of here all day long. Saudi-owned farms aren't the only growers from the Middle East. In Mojave County, Arizona, a company from the United Arab Emirates purchased thousands of acres of land to cultivate pistachios, another thirsty crop. Amid the controversy over precious water being used to enrich Mideast operations, Arizona recently ended land leases that gave Fondamonte, that company growing alfalfa hay, the ability to pump unlimited groundwater. Fondamonte says it will appeal Arizona's decision. Not all of the company's farms here are affected by the governor's move, which doesn't impact other foreign companies now farming in the state. For Full Measure, I'm Scott Thuman in Salome, Arizona. And after a break, what's ahead next week on Full Measure? Coming up next week on Full Measure, we return to our examination of health concerns caused by COVID and COVID vaccines that are plaguing millions of Americans. Sometimes, if I'll address one mechanism, I can hit a home run with a patient. Like sometimes one medicine, boom, they're like, oh my God, I feel better. The vast majority, it's more iterative. Sometimes I feel like I'm putting Humpty Dumpty together. And it takes a long time to sit there and, and balance where you're going to focus. Because usually they're, they're all related in some ways, but you attack, I, at least I do, attack the thing that seems to be the most prominent first. The latest emerging research on long COVID and long vax and the lack of attention to the problem from top public health officials next week on Full Measure. Until then, we'll be searching for more stories that hold powers accountable. Thanks for watching.